I don't know if our episode did it or what, but uh, the fact that we talked about Corbin and we were like, oh, well, you know, there's still some hope we ended it with being like, at least, you know, he's still a member of Parliament. Yeah, that would be great to see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then today, now that we're recording this episode, today, what is today? We're recording this episode, yeah. October 30th, uh, and yeah, yesterday he was suspended from the Labor Party. It was funny, because I re-listened to the episode today when it went up, and, um, uh, at one point you say something along the lines of, uh... At least we'll have a crop of Labor MPs. <laughs> yeah, Corbyn that he'll lead the Labor MPs. <laughs> and then you also said, man, at least, uh, like, I really wish he would be able to, like, free himself and just talk like a firebrand, <laughs> talk however he wanted to. So thanks a lot for that, Dan. Yeah. Ugh. Is that what he's gonna do? I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I know enough about it to... I mean, what, he's just been suspended from the Labor Party, so is that, like, is he able to come to Westminster, or is it just that he's not involved in the PLP, or what does that even mean? No, I mean, he's still an MP, so he's yeah. both been suspended from the Labor Party, and he's had the whip withdrawn, which means that he's also not a Labor MP. Mm. He's now an independent MP. Jeez, I didn't know you could do that. Um, I think it's sort of pending um, some kind of formal process of deciding whether he did actually do something wrong. <laughs> yeah. But I don't you never know with these things. Maybe it's I think it's... I think an it's, execution, I really don't know. Yeah, I think it's interesting in terms of, like, Labour Party kind of softies, like, the kind of, like, not super Corbinite people. Or even, like, I don't know, like, even some socialists have been, like, you know, we'll wait and see what Keir Starmer, who he's going to be, what's he going to be like, we'll wait and see, you know, how, if he, if he doesn't align with our interests, oh, you know, we'll see, oh, that'll be bad, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, we'll yeah. see what he does, and it's like, I don't know how, but like, day one, he was already like, yeah, I'm not aligning with your interests. Yeah, 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 you're yeah. shaking your fist at him, but I don't think there's anything, like... Yeah, exactly. I'm shaking my fist and I'm yeah. not doing anything, but at least I'm angry about it. Young leftist shouts at cloud. <laughs> yeah, 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 God. There's the thumbnail for the episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it just it does seem like um, everybody's making the most catastrophic, bad strategic decisions they could possibly make. Like, yep. Jeremy Corbyn wasn't particularly strategic as an approach. Keir Starmer, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's hard not to just think that his aim is to take every, the first possible opportunity <laughs> to do the most sort of like to do the thing which most aligns with mm. the sort of like um, yeah I don't know I'm trying to I'm trying to find a phrase that's not wet dream <laughs> like just the, just the, just the dreams of like the most reactionary yeah. labor and like yeah well this figures, is I suppose like. well so we talked about Corbin last week we now know that this is a cursed podcast um whatever we talk about uh mm. the opposite's gonna happen um, so this so week, we're going to usher in the beginnings of capitalism. <laughs> yeah, <isn't it>? exactly. <laughs> so this week we're talking about uh, what is capitalism? Where did it come from? What is it? Uh, you want to intro this one? Because this was your uh, uh, suggestion. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, we've um, we've been working from Ellen Meeksin's Woods, The Origins of Capitalism, a longer view. A longer view, still only 200 pages <laughs> and relatively few words on a page. Um, but tremendously concise and incredibly well written and very readable I read it three or four or five years ago and it had quite an impact just because it, I felt like I'd gotten like a very full picture and image of a concept kind of thing and one which you feel very uh, informed and elucidated from the reading of the book um, I mean I think this episode we're just going to cover the first section um, so sort of an incomplete picture but hopefully we'll return <laughs> to it in the next few weeks yeah 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 um, yeah so part one Ellen Meekson's Woods the origin of capitalism um, yeah, I guess it makes sense to do this pretty early on just because, uh, as I think we'll see in this episode, especially when we talk about different Marxists who have tried to tackle this question about where capitalism came from and what is capitalism, um, there's a lot of disagreement mm -hmm. and it can be pretty vague if you just say capitalism. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and it's, it says a tremendous amount about, um, what your position are, is on a great many of the things like what, your understanding of the transition from cap from feudalism to capitalism informs your understanding of the transition from any other transition or ideally a transition to socialism or whatever else it is mm. that comes after capitalism kind of thing mm. and there's a great a great as ever in sort of marxian socialist theory there's a great amount of politics on show on some occasions yeah not particularly highly highlighted in this book but you can sort of tell what's going on a little bit did you like it i did i did really like it yeah yeah, yeah. um like you said yeah very readable um, it is funny with most of these books. I don't know if this is just a Verso books thing or what, or if it's just like a Marxist book thing, but she does spend the first 
section, if not half of the book, being like, here's what everybody else has said, and here's why they're wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, that, the basis of the section we're going to cover today is all the various debates. <laughs> I mean, she, do, she does introduce people who align with her thinking on this thing, or even <clears> from whom. Uh, her thinking perhaps originates kind of mm. yeah yeah um, to make it to make a broader point um was this expanded from an essay it might have been i think yeah there was a shorter version and then this is an yeah. expanded longer version so we're not reading as long as a version of as we could but this is still quite a no this is the longer us. version this, this is, is the longest this is the extended version, version. Yeah. this is this is all that you get yeah, it's all that you're gonna get and we're doing part one which it's is the first is. i think 70 yeah. something pages um so yeah i guess just to get right into it i mean she makes the distinction pretty early on that um, capitalism is more than just people exchanging goods for profit, right? She says that if you have that idea, um, then you're going to completely misunderstand um, its impact and its history, right? So she says that, and this isn't, this isn't like a, a huge like groundbreaking um, idea, but it's one that I think a lot of even just Marxists need to be reminded of, is that capitalism, or at least I suppose markets became capitalist, she says, but when they became compulsory to engage. Mm -hmm. If you're an economic mm -hmm. actor mm -hmm. and you're alive now, you have to engage in markets, basically if you want uh, access to the means of survival, right? So it's been just that kind of uh, pushes back against the typical like Adam Smithy kind of view of capitalism mm -hmm. is just like the propensity to trade. Right? Yeah, what's the, yeah, to truck, barter, and trade is sort of like <laughs> yeah. the quote from Smith that she uses. Like, <laughs> TB and T. Uh, yes, quite, yeah. So human beings have some innate desire or to sort of like behave or... Uh, operate along certain principles which just so happen to align with mm. um, the, sort of, the, the highest values of our contemporary economic model. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> Adam Smith writing when that model was coming into place. Like Exactly, like, yeah. It's interesting, yeah, it's interesting whenever there's these big shifts you do need these ideologues to come along and say mm. this is how it's always been. Like a new ideology really needs some ideologues to sort of validate it. Yeah, absolutely. On, it, yeah. on an intellectual level kind of thing. And also to like to look back on and to kind of uh, retroactively create them as ideologues because it's like what's the main thing that everybody every free marketeer points to with Adam Smith it's the invisible hand, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like all right, well, I don't know. That wasn't like a huge thing for Adam Smith, but we look back on him and we're like the Invisible Hand. Sure, guy, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Again, um, yeah, before... he does serve as a stooge for the contemporary. Like you're, exactly. you're trapped in a horrible position. Yeah, you, like, uh, yeah. Before we go any further, um... once you die, like people will just do anything with your legacy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, just don't have a legacy, and then <laughs> yeah, that's our that's our plan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we go any further, let's not uh, recreate the mistake of last week. This is auxiliary statements. I'm Jack. I'm Dan. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. This is the, um, from our perspective, this is the first week where we actually have listeners. Yeah. So exactly. welcome. You you really you do exist. You do exist There's beyond just being uh, figments yeah, of our yeah, imagination. Yeah. 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 So All thank right. you, thank you, thank you, mom and dad. <laughs> um, so yeah, to get back to it, um, I'll, I'm just going to read a quote from her where she put like, again where she pushes back on that Adam Smith uh, kind of typical idea of how capitalism came into being. So she, sa she says, in most accounts of capitalism and its origin, there really is no origin. Capitalism seems to always be there somewhere. It only needs to be released from its change, for instance, from the fetters of feudalism, to be allowed to grow and mature. Typically, these fetters are political, the parasitic powers of lordship or the restrictions of an autocratic state. Sometimes they're cultural or ideological. Perhaps they're the wrong religion. Blah, 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 blah. I'm skipping forward a bit. That assumption is typically connected with the other presupposition that history has been on an almost natural process of technological development. One way or another, capitalism more or less naturally appears, one in where expanding markets and technological development reach the right level, allowing sufficient wealth to be accumulated so that it can be profitably reinvested. Many Marxist explanations of this are fundamentally the same, with the addition of the bourgeois revolutions to help break the fetters. So that last bit, um, she will go on to push back on basically all of that, especially the technological determinism of this kind of commercialization theory, as she calls it, and also the kind of Marxist um, views of bourgeois revolutions, which is, yeah, 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 which is very interesting. And it's, it's, it's good to kind of read a book like this. It wasn't written too long ago, although it might have been two decades ago now. Yeah, 2002, I suppose. It's, it's good to read a book like this to kind of just reset your head straight, right? Because... As Marxist, right? I mean, we're not supposed to have any like huge grand historical theories that don't hold up to the specificities. But at the same time, it's like if you do want to understand something like the transition from feudalism to capitalism, you need to have something to guide you, right? And whether that's historical materialism or whatever, um, 
Yeah, yeah, like I said, you, you do need something. And so it's good in this book that even in just in the introduction, he sets up that this might be what a lot of you have kind of fallen back into believing. And uh, I'm gonna, here to set the record straight, <laughs> Ella Meekson's wood. So, yeah, it's, just yeah it's incredibly like um, granular, fine details, like in the history as it happens, sort of like not presuming anything of the future. Yeah, incredibly detailed reading of the story kind of thing. Yeah. But one which still has the elements of a, a grand arc at the same time kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, which we're all looking for. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So then she goes in, uh, the first chapter, she basically describes the commercialization model, which is what we're all taught, right? And it's kind of more or less what you th probably think, even if you've tried to um, delve into Marx's thought. Um, and it's basically what? I mean, it's basically the idea, it's the Adam Smith, what you're saying, the TBT, the propensity to truck, barter, and trade, right? It's that, you know, if you go back and look at how things were, and the asterisk is how things were in, like, Europe, Western Europe, uh, let's say the, the time of the Roman Empire, people were always trading. You know, you had your Crassuses, you had guys trading, they expanded their empires so that they could trade. Um, there were always markets, right? And so whether... Uh, the fetters that were stopping these markets from becoming fully capitalist were technological, or whether they were political or whatever, they've slowly, over the you know grinding wheel of history, slowly fallen away, and now we're left with the beauty that is capitalism, right? Yeah, that's basically what she says, is that like whichever theory it is that you subscribe to to, for, to explain the origins of capitalism, um, all of those theories usually re rest on... Um, there was something holding capitalism back. Yeah, exactly. And as soon as those fetters were removed, um, it was able to f flourish. One of the, one of the, well, yeah, one of the, she's, she's, she is um, trying to develop a theory of capitalism or, or, or any historical stage really, which um, recognizes the specificity of that stage. Um, but more than that, she makes the criticism that uh, most theories of the transition do, does something that she calls begging the question. By which she means that they um, presume the existence of the thing which they're actually claiming to explain. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so human beings, we've we've capitalist societies developed, and one of the tenets of capitalist societies say um, to work for a profit, to seek to reinvest profits to make further capital, kind of thing. That that sort of like expansion of wealth through investment. Um, and through sort of advantageous trade and the like, um, she 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 says that the traditional models see that in a sort of like um, diminished form in ancient societies and claim that it was just waiting to be allowed to flourish into full full blown capitalism kind of thing. The 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 argument made by the so called commercialization explanation is that um, enough space was given to commerce and to short distance trade in western europe that um large sums of capital were able to be accumulated and then human beings having their natural tr propensity to trade suddenly found themselves with these huge caches of money and did what any 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 self-respecting human being would do they invested them to in to for profitable ends kind of thing exactly um so yeah i mean that's the that's the explanation which she is um, criticizing. Um, I mean, the other, the other elements, the other sort of inflection of it is this distinction she makes between, you've already raised it to some extent, between um, a compulsion and opportunity. Um, the traditional model of the, the traditional explanation for the transition would say that as soon as human beings were given the opportunity to behave as capitalists, they took it uh, <laughs> because what else would they do yeah um whereas she is trying to she her alternate model that she's offering um is one very much more focused on human beings or uh yeah people living under feudalism being, being compelled to act differently what was it that made them act against the thing the, the things that motivated them to behave in, a, in in terms of in along a feudal mode of production and instead necessitated that sort of um, switch kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, but yeah, before we go on to kind of get into what those were, like what compelled them to act in markets and what necessitated um, the difference between opportunity and um, necessity in being an economic actor and engaging with markets, you should probably uh, go over a definition of capital, right? 
because to Marx, and this is what all of this is built on, um, capital isn't just money, right? It's not just it's not just uh, dollars and cents or pounds and pence, should I say? Um, uh, uh, capital includes the social relations that we have now that make them capitalist, right? So one of the things that capitalism needs to be capitalism uh, are the social relations that we currently have, right, between producers and uh, exploiters or, um, uh, yeah, between producers and exploiters or anything like that. Go back to listen, go back to listen to uh, episode one where we talk about what it means to be working class if you'd like an explanation uh, further on that. Um, yeah, 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 I guess she, she basically tries to define capitalism as something other than just engaging in markets, and that is something with very specific social forms. Yeah, I mean, you, you're, you, again, it's coming back to this compulsion idea, right? Like, markets have existed throughout human history. There's been a marketplace. You go and exchange goods. Um, she claims that in quite a lot of those cases, they were quite heavily regulated to prevent the behavior that we would associate with capitalism, right? Profit-seeking and the like. Um, mostly they were just for the distribution of goods. Um, at some point, it became the only way in which for you for you to both, the only thing you could do with the goods that you produce was to trade them on the market. And the only way for you to get the necessities of life was to go to the market and um, gain them there. Um, so yeah, at a certain point, um, Engaging in market-based relations was the only way in which you could survive. Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah. Which is the world in which we live in now, right? Like, mm. um, Capitalists don't produce things for their own use, nor for the use of the people they produce them for, right? They produce the thing which is most profitable for them. Exactly. Um, and yeah, and we're not just talking about like desks and chairs, right? Like we're talking about the things that you need to survive. They're not produced for the sake of production, for giving people things. It's... For profit, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And, li- and and likewise, like um, you and I, without any substantial um, access to means of production of our own, um, have to accept whatever the market value of our ability to work is, <laughs> which isn't much. Yeah, <laughs> and then we just have to accept the prices offered to us on the market for the sort of the meager number of things that we're able to buy with the small wage that we've been able to sell <laughs> exactly, for. <laughs> exactly. I mean, maybe we're just not trading very well, right? Maybe we, <laughs> maybe we, we need to, um, we, need to just, we, need to, we just need to, we just need to develop, decide that our labor is worth more. You know what? From this day forward, it is worth more. I'll see what that gets me. <laughs> she, she's, she's as equally critical of some Marxist explanations of the origins of capitalism as she is to non-Marxist ones. Absolutely. She thinks that some of them really fall for some a, a very similar fault um explaining capitalism is just a removal of fetters and the like Mm. um and it's worth saying that there are there are there are there is it's not unprecedented in marx that kind of explanation it's another one of these things where there is a younger marx and a more mature marx as people tend to say yeah she goes into that right she talks about kind of his point of view in the communist manifesto uh versus his view in capital and in the grundrisse right um she says that he kind of did fall prey at the beginning to that view of like the big wheel of history, maybe, you know, we go from the ancient mode to this mode. To yeah, I mean, it's st- still it's still quite Hegelian and also just this general sort of like enlightenment image of into which it was the milieu of the time. Like, yeah, yeah. This this gradual process toward yeah, yeah. Uh, enlightenment and the like. Um, and also his writings at, at that time quite um, economically didn't. Uh, technologically determinist in some respects, like uh, mm. thinking of uh, like, uh, relations have been production being determined by changes in the yeah um, by the industrial re- revolution yeah, means by... of production and the like yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah. but the later the, but the later Marx does have this much more um, uh, well the later there is a there is a mature Marx and he has a uh, a more considered um, position not th- thoroughly worked out but um in some ways evident in the latter stages of um episode one <laughs> episode one das capital. Uh, yeah das capital episode one the holodeck but, episode yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, is marx ever on the holodeck do they ever run i can guarantee you he's not ever on the holodeck that would i don't be mean episode. i don't mean Karl marx but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i can, imma- I can scenes. really imagine <laughs> Data's like, oh, 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 oh primitive no. accumulation. Right. Yeah, no, I don't suppose so. I, don't suppose so. <laughs> I think um, he does get a quote in, in one of the... De- There's an episode of um, of Deep Space Nine where really? they form a union in, in, the, <laughs> really? in Quark's bar. Quark's brother mm. Nog tries to form a trade union. 
And I think someone gives him some marks. <laughs> it's 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 a bit, sort of propels him along the way. It's good to know the struggle. Uh, but yeah, may, maybe that, that maybe Marx really doesn't up. ever make an appearance on the holodeck. Freud, <laughs> Freud's on the holodeck. Yeah, at one yeah, point. yeah. Sherlock Holmes, or at least the data. Sherlock Holmes, quite frequently. Do. What am I looking for here? Um, <laughs> I was going to say you set us up perfectly to talk about primitive accumulation. Quite, that's exactly what I wanted to say. Yeah, yeah, uh, wave length, wave length. After you, please. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what was I going to say? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, it's weird. It's, it's interesting because I've come across this phrase "primitive accumulation," and I always just assumed it was one for Marx. I know, me too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also, I just assumed Marx held to an opinion of what a primitive accumulation was that actually he was out to critique, kind of thing. He was after it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and I've already sort of I've already spoken about it a little bit, but it was basically just the idea that once you can amass a certain sum of wealth. Um, that wealth is automatically capital, and you just and you uh, you use it as an investment to, and as a way to try and expand that pool of, of yeah. Of Once you have a little bit of money, you make okay. more money, and then a lot of people have thought that. So there, there's kind of like the typical view that after the Black Death, right, so many people died, including so many nobles, that like um, it was easy for peasants who got a little bit of money to become grown to burgers, right? Which is uh, people who kind of became like the first proto bourgeoisie, like not necessarily nobility. Uh, well, yeah, not nobility, but they had enough money to compete with the nobility in terms of status, right? Um, and so then, yeah, Marx pushes back on that idea of, of what he calls so-called primitive accumulation. <laughs> I mean, I've got a quote so here. Yeah, he is. It's one of those classic Marx things uh, where she says, a decisive break in this classic model came with Marx's critique of political economy and its notion of primitive accumulation. His definition of capital not simply as wealth or profit, but also as a social relation, and its emphasis on the transformation of social property relations as the real primitive accumulation. So what she's saying there is that Marx didn't think of primitive accumulation as just this like very literal, like primitively like hoarding money and then becoming like a proto-capitalist. He thought of it more as like the real primitive accumulation wasn't hoarded money. Um, or at least accumulated money. It was uh, social relations that kind of, I suppose, like accumulated over time and specifically accumulated in the English countryside, right? And it's interesting. It's, it's, it's really, really interesting. So I'll read another quote. He said, or she says, the primitive accumulation of classical political economy is so cold because capital, as Marx defines it, is a social relation and not just any kind of wealth or profit. So we just went into that. But, she says, accumulation is n as such is not what brings about capitalism. While the accumulation of wealth was obviously a necessary condition of capitalism, it was far from being sufficient or decisive. What transformed wealth into capital was a transformation of social property relations. So, she'll go on later in this part to talk about a couple different people who will kind of study, jump, use that as a jumping off point and study what that means. Um, but just there, that is the general jumping off point, as I say, of all of these different theorists trying to figure out what capitalism is and where it came from, right? So it isn't sufficient enough just to use the old commercialization model to say capitalism just happens when people get enough money and they just figure it out and they get rid of feudalism and they get rid of all of this. It's these social relations, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the difference between a, a qualitative increase as opposed to a... No, a quantitative increase as opposed yeah. to a qualitative change. Yeah. There was a qualitative change. Um, it's not just a, a, a gradual increase of some sort pools of cash or the like i mean i like that line that wealth is not capital yeah capital um in the way that we mean to use it in the way that marx means to use it um is a very specific thing it fulfills a very specific function um and it can really only be that thing and fulfill that function under a specific set of property relations yeah uh, and a specific set of social relations like they've always been um people with greater sums of wealth than others like feudalism had a class system and we mm. all know this like there was a landlord and there were uh peasants um <laughs> but by virtue of having great sums of wealth um it did that did not mean that they decided to um a attempt to reinvest that wealth uh, with the view to expanding production and therefore economic growth kind of thing like exactly. feudalism in a lot of respects was a an easy way to think about it the difference is like capitalism we all know about growth and gdp and everything hangs on growth um businesses go out of business if they don't successfully um grow if they don't uh, increase year on year the amount of money that they're making capital feudalism in a lot of ways like a zero growth economy like it was like so long as everything was sustained and stayed the same um 
everybody was everybody was happy yeah and that, yeah i think that's a good point is that like a lot of people were if not happy then kind of content with the system that existed and again a lot of asterisks to that a lot of rebellions and revolts and revolutions and stuff like that but um so yeah there's this like um i don't know what i don't know what point in the book it comes up kind of thing but um there is this perception of um oh we one shouldn't be inclined to think of feudalism as being inherently unstable in some way like um obviously it's part of the sort of traditional explanation of the transition that feudalism was sort of waiting to fall and in some of those explanations like feudalism was the fetter like um ancient greece and rome were on a trajectory toward like being commercial market-based capitalism, which I kind of think is fake news. And, yeah, but... yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then feudalism got in the way, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but also, like feudalism endured for an incredibly long time, it was an incredibly stable system. Hmm. Um, and again, shouldn't as we'll look see... on it as anything like ready to fall. And even the thing that does topple as, topple it isn't um, some great contradiction at its heart kind of thing it's just some sort of freak change in behavior and some sort of backward island off the yeah. coast of europe kind of thing exactly but, yeah uh, yeah just, and just some freak collection of circumstances and some people deciding to behave slightly differently and they took over the world yeah. it's not it was they, yeah it wasn't <laughs> bastards like, yeah, yeah, yeah. well yeah and as we'll and see that's, that's why you can also critique the marxist versions right because the marxist versions are quite often like that quite also fall into this sort of like great eruption this great revolutionary moment where sort of like um yeah the bourgeois revolution they're quite right? the bourgeois revolutions yeah. which we will get on to this yeah like a critique yeah. The, a critique of the very concept of bourgeois revolution yeah um, and to, to add on just a bit of to what you're saying we'll also see later on that um a lot of these feudal societies really like you said earlier really resisted capitalism coming mm -hmm. um, especially she gives a great example of france which kind of seems a little backwards if you're coming at it from a Mar marxist angle because you're like oh but the french revolution the great force revolution uh come on what about that they really wanted it but it's like uh, no uh, that is no, not the case it wasn't their aim <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly yeah yeah a great distinction we'll talk about this a bit later is the distinction between bourgeois and capitalist which is uh pretty good so the one of the first people that she uses to kind of um begin this she kind of ends her critiquing of the typical liberal explanation of the commercialization theory and all that and how uh, capitalism came about um the next person she brings up to kind of talk about left-wing critiques and how they're wrong is um carl polanyi right so to kick us off there i'll read another little quote he says only in market society is there a distinct economic motive distinct economic institutions and relations separated from non-market relations because human beings in nature in the form of labor and land are treated however fictitiously as commodities in a self-regulating system of markets driven by a price mechanism society itself just becomes an adjunct of the market a market economy can exist only in market society that is in a society where instead of an economy embedded in social relations social relations are embedded in the economy so that's that's pretty you know yeah it's a lot of things that we've already said and it's a lot of things really we've great already summing said. up like, it's yeah, a great yeah. line of yeah yeah hey thank you but that's also just very much like he's getting into a little bit of like the fetishization of commodities and of labor and all of this stuff but it is yeah that line human beings in nature in the form of labor and land are treated however fictitiously as commodities in a self-regulating system of markets yeah yeah, yeah. He, she she speaks very she has some critiques of polanyi but also speaks very favorably favorably of him because as you've just heard he was willing to um try and look for the specificity of each of these systems and not to try to see continuity between them. Um, obviously, pointing out how um, markets function very differently in the very different types of societies. And the one thing that he does, um, which I, which was quite, quite nice to hear in some respects or interesting to hear in some respects, like, because from, from the, from the sort of Smithian example, explanation that you get, where capitalism is the sort of full flourishing of human nature. Polanyi, um, really willing to um, think along the lines of the transition to full-blown market societies as being really injurious to human beings. Like yeah, absolutely. Quite a, quite a big shock. Uh, and we will come onto it later a little mm -hmm. bit in the work of like E.P. Thompson and, and people like that. Mm -hmm. Like The experience of being forced to behave very differently to access your uh, to 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 be deprived of any direct control over both your work and also like 
uh, any ownership of the the means of your subsistence and then to be so heavily dependent on the market and to start behaving in such different ways very competitive ways um things which um degrees of competition which in some i, I mean I, it's quite a bold statement but i go far, so far to say it might even have flown in the face they flew in the face at least of the human nature that was um the nature of human beings living under feudalism yeah um, sure yeah yeah, yeah. Maybe they even fly in the face of human nature entirely, but like... Mm. Yeah, um, she says at one point that the history of its implementation, meaning the history of self-regulating markets, um, had to at the same time be the history of the protection from its ravages. And then she quotes Polanyi as saying, without protective countermoves and countermeasures, particularly by the means of state intervention, human society would have been annihilated. Which is very dramatic, <laughs> but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it gives them... It's the right vibe, right? It's like, the right vibe. Um, yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He makes the case. Yeah, he's basically saying that states had to intervene to smooth over the incredibly rough edges of this transition kind of thing. It was brutal. It was blunt um, and quite violent to human beings and their sensibilities. And what do you think? What do you think about making a comparison between what he says there to a comparison between imperialism, right? Between just thrusting this kind of new way of doing things upon places where yeah, it's not really the way it happened. Mm-hmm. I suppose, you know, there's more to be said there about just general, you know, brutality of the markets themselves um, to exploit uh, people in, say, uh, Australia or, um, you know, everywhere outside of Europe, mm-hmm. basically. Mm-hmm. But also, it, yeah, it would be interesting to read something that uses that idea of... Um, what happens when capitalism is just thrust upon people without uh, any kind of protective countermeasures? Mm. Comparing that with imperialism, mm-hmm, I wonder, mm-hmm, wonder if there's mm-hmm. anything to be said there. Maybe not. Um, I mean, I don't. I, I would only have like sort of spo- spontaneous remarks to make. Although, <laughs> quite ha- kind of quite remarks. happy to sort of uh, to go off on it. I mean, in some respects, like uh, at this point in history, where we're talking about like capitalism is still very new and still really quite unknown, um, and there was living memory of its non-existence, kind of thing. Mm. Um, as opposed to like capitalism flourishing and existing in the Western world and then sort of being imposed upon um, other parts of the world, um, I can imagine that was that imposition in the form of imperialism, colonialism was done with a great, much greater degree of confidence. Um, I mean, I'm sure there was probably also a great deal of racism involved. Sure, um, sure, as always. So I don't know. But I mean, like, her, uh, Mixes was critique of Polanyi is basically that Polanyi's explanation of the transition itself is quite closely related to one which would be technologically determinist Um, and the sort of like the injurious experience of the imposition of market relations and market forces into people's lives really what he's talking about there is actually the industrial revolution so you could the, the the experience that you're looking for you could probably quite easily find if you just looked 50 years earlier. Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, I, th- I think, like, the place to go is E.P. Thompson and his account of, like, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. the origins of the English working class. Absolutely, we'll yeah. Get yeah, exactly. Both maybe reading some of that book for ourselves, but also yeah. reading Meeks and Woods' <laughs> summary. offering. Yeah. Summary, like, <laughs> several-page summary. Yeah. Also, I mean, I guess you could just look at... Um, uh, I haven't brought this up on a previous episode, but uh, look at during the French Revolution in like the Western provinces of France, right, where people were completely happy with their feudal uh, obligations and their feudal dues, mostly because these were kind of like poorer parts of France where the nobility was also poorer, mm-hmm. so they weren't constantly exploiting the peasantry. They were kind of helping the peasantry out. Same for the church, right? I mean, in places like the Vendée where there were like the worst um, civil wars, people really resistant to this new change, this new kind of bourgeois um, invention. Um, there's probably, yeah. probably similar parallels to be drawn with um, the peasants' commitment to the Tsar in in Russia. Sure. Yeah. As well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw uh, on Twitter somebody posted a nude photo of the Tsar. It was pretty it was weird. It was really, I was like, where did this come from? They were like, I'm doing my PhD and I found, uh, just going through some archives, I found a, him swimming naked at like one of his uh, things. I'll say pretty ripped. The guy was pretty ripped. Which one? Nicholas. Nicholas, okay. yeah. He was okay. swole, as okay. some people might say. Anyway, what was I talking yeah, about? Don't work a day in your life. <laughs> I'm just thinking, <laughs> oh, you know what I was going to say? Lifting and no, 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. praying. Like lifting, lifting and praying. Lifting and praying, baby. <laughs> Was it you who told me that uh, Rasputin was like? I think that might have been Ed. Yeah, like eight eight foot tall. He was eight (laughs) ten. I think it's interesting, and I do kind of want to. He just stooped a lot. He stooped a lot. (laughs) 
Um, I do kind of want to touch on this before we move on a little bit, which is I think a lot of people viewing Marxism for the first time can kind of see these views of the origin of capitalism as kind of like fetishizing, and I don't mean that in the Marxist sense, kind of fetishizing the previous modes of production, mm. which is in no way what I think any of these people are doing, right? Like, despite what I said about like people of Vaude were happy with their novels, <laughs> like, I, I, you know, it's important to note. Yeah, but they didn't. Also, they didn't know what. Yeah, they didn't know yeah. what it would be like to live in the twenty first century. If they exactly. were shown that option, maybe they'd take yeah. it. Who knows? Yeah, exactly. Well, maybe it'd be terrifying. I mean, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think it's like if you try and explain Marxism to someone very like briefly, it can kind of come across where you're like, oh, so what? You think that like feudalism was better? You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, no. <laughs> is the answer to that? No, yeah, yeah. no. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> anyway, the next person, the next person that she kind of talks about is Perry Anderson. Uh, sure, she yeah. gives him the same treatment. She brings up um, a lot of what she agrees with and then kind of throws him to the side, right, to talk about other people. Um, but it's interesting because Perry Anderson kind of tries to, at least in this book, define feudalism, which I think is interesting. Mm-hmm. So he talks about how um, feudalism as a mode of production defined by an organic unity of economy and polity, which took the form of a chain of parcelized sovereignties, sovereignties. State power was fragmented among feudal lords, and lordship represented, as she says, a unity of political and economic power. Yeah, and unity of economic and political power, right? Um, and I mean, he goes on to say that that caused a lot of trouble um, by around the time when absolutism started to become a thing, because the economy was growing so much, and economic power of these lords was growing so much, and, you know, people like burghers and like proto-bourgeoisie people, that it couldn't keep up with the um, concentrated political power mm-hmm. of the nobility yeah he makes some it's, it's, I had two um very important contributions to this book his, his appearance in the book makes some very important contributions to this book um and um, <laughs> by virtue of that fact i suppose his theories have introduced interesting things to theory in general <laughs> wow look at that um, there you go you made the theory. um I, you, yeah the one that you state obviously the distinction between um capitalism and feudalism being one in which uh, the question of how the surplus is extracted from uh, the respective working classes of those two systems, right? The producers, yeah. Yeah, the producers. Like um, Under feudalism, the extraction was after the process of production. Like, the feudal peasants uh, grew whatever crops they grew, and then the local lord came and took his share. So a sort of extra economic form of um, expropriation, whereas under capitalism, what you have is an economic form of expropriation, whereby the surplus is extracted in the very process of um, production itself, which is very hard, very much because it, under feudalism, you can you know what's happening, yeah. you're getting swindled. Exactly. Well, yeah. I mean, you're not necessarily getting swindled. Like maybe you, you love your local lord. I mean, you're probably you're getting swindled. <laughs> but like you 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 you're at least aware of the the extractive process happening. Whereas under cap- under capitalism, we're not right. We think that we're getting paid um, our due, amount. but yeah, yeah, we're, yeah, we're not necessarily getting paid the full value of what we contribute to the productive process. Yeah, man, you should see what kind of value I have. <laughs> You've job. been working damn hard today, <laughs> <laughs> not today necessarily. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. But that that distinction between um, and then it, yeah, that has a cor- cor- corollary. Corollary has a corollary. <laughs> um, there, uh, a corollary um, idea from that is that uh, under capitalism there is a separation between economic and political, whereas under feudalism there is this fusion of the two. Um, you, you you have rights to exploit because of political power that you have, mm. whereas under capitalism, like political power gives you no specific right to exploit. Um, the army's not just going to show up and. <laughs> take a certain portion of my shit kind of exactly. thing. Yeah, yeah, not that I have exactly. anything worth taking but yeah. uh, that's that's not how our system works kind of thing yeah yeah and, was, and, and then yeah I mean, so there, there, there's contribution one contribution two is this idea of um i mean i'm sure it's not unique to perry anderson nor did, nor did he create it but in the context of this book the introduction of the idea of uh, french state absolutism yeah 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 um a very different process was happening in france as was ha- compared to what was happening in england uh, in England, you were getting the sort of like nascent beginnings of capitalism, um, whereas in France, what you had was basically um, a fusion, a coalescing of all these tiny little lordships. You would, I assume, 
we would all imagine feudalism to be one local lord and a certain number of peasants are quite quite a sort of small unit um, whereas a, as the nation state kind of coalesced in France all of those units sort of became fused together to the point where um, the chief expropriator was the state itself yeah still under feudal terms in the sense that like um, there was no um, investment of um, capital to make to it with a view to making profits kind of thing there was yeah. no uh, process of valorizing capital kind of thing but the expropriation took the form of taxation by the state um, and the the roles that the sort of the ruling class the exploiting class roles that were of significance were um, positions in the state hierarchy being yeah. a, a sort of bureaucrat or lawyer of some sort. Yeah. Um, Perry Anderson, Perry Anderson uses the idea of uh, French state absolutism, absolutism as an adjunct to his explanation for the origins of capitalism. He thinks that it it served to break this connection between um, the economic and the political. Mixon's Woods takes a takes a different position by suggesting, quite intriguingly, I'm a big fan of like an alternate history, um, <laughs> that. French absolutism itself could have been a different route out of feudalism. Like it, yeah. it could have been the beginnings of some other form of um, a sort of political economic system. King Macron. <laughs> quite, quite. <laughs> if, it, if it hadn't been for the pesky English. Yeah, bastards uh, again, yeah, Jesus. Coming up with something better. Yeah. So she, so yeah, so she quotes Anderson as saying, um, bringing kind of another contribution, which he says, with the general, uh, with the generalized commutation of dues into money rents, um, the cellular unity of political and economic oppression of the peasantry was gravely weakened and threatened to become disassociated. The result was a displacement of political legal coercion upwards towards a centralized militarized summit, the absolutist state. And then she says, in other words, in order to strengthen their weakened hold on the peasantry, feudal lords concentrated their formerly fragmented or parcelized coercive powers in a new kind of centralized monarchy. So I think it's interesting too, like it is what you're saying that this was like, oh, this is another way out of feudalism, right? This is something different than just a typical path of like instrument of production, feudalism, absolute state capitalism, that kind of linear, it's not as linear as that, right? Mm -hmm. But what she's also saying um, is that uh, it, the absolutist state was kind of developed unintentionally almost as a way to hold on to the status quo and anderson here kind of just seems to be saying that it was a way to hold on that it was a way for the nobility to hold on to what they had to strengthen their grip on the peasants right to, to make it even better right to really continue feudalism not to make something new mm -hmm. but she also continues like later on in the book right to say that the peasants were kind of doing the same thing like in england they just wanted the status quo to stay the same but in doing that they unintentionally created a brand new system which eventually became capitalism sure yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Da, da, da. <laughs> <laughs> which is nuts people yeah, ladies yeah, and gentlemen yeah. folks yeah, it's yeah, nuts yeah. good yeah. lord um, and i mean yeah, the, the um i don't know whether we intended to cover this but it's sort of like as a connection it makes sense um the crux of some of the marxist debates that were happening hinged on this very idea of was it the case that basically was the thing that came to disrupt feudalism and bring and, and usher in capitalism was it um external to the functioning of feudalism or was it something internal to its its functioning and mm -hmm. as you've just described like um both in the case of the development towards french state or just the absolutist state and also toward a uh, capitalism in england what the motivating factor was how do we keep our relationships the same not how do we create some radically new. overturn them kind of yeah. thing yeah. um and it's not it's not like um the, the it's not like the contending classes of feudalism were had some kind of compact together with the intention of keeping the world the same but um the class struggle that was the struggle between feudal classes was meant to maintain the feudal classes it wasn't meant to, meant to overturn the whole system kind exactly of yeah. there was conflict and there was struggle but nobody in in either of those um, countries uh, was imagining something so radical as a transition to another mode of production, as it yeah. were. Yeah, it's funny to think of guys like uh, you know uh, Frederick the Great or like Catherine the Great 
or any of these other like enlightened despotic monarchs right as being something other than like they're just really smart great rulers it's like well they're kind of just the culmination right of this weird trend that is just like centralization 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 to hang on to this like incredibly backward yeah, way yeah, yeah, of yeah. Uh, producing things yeah it's funny yeah Damn you me. haven't your history's put you in your position you haven't put yourself in your position <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and so so meeksons would i don't know whether they're called her meek is it i don't think it's hyphenated is that is meeksons her middle name or is I, it um she married a wood <laughs> <Okay>. so <laughs> i assume she, I, I assume she's just added <laughs> their surname to her own gotcha okay so Meeksons would. Meeksin? Yeah. Meeksin So I, I'm taking them it to be a combined surname. Meeksin yeah, would. Yeah, yeah. So Meeksin would then says that one of the things that Anderson uh, gets caught up on is this, again, this is exactly what happens with the commercialization model, with the Smithian model. I like calling it the Smithian model, that's fun <laughs> to say, is that it again just becomes an idea of liberating towards capitalism, right? Just getting yeah, rid yeah, of the fetters, the fetters and we'll the finally get there. And it's funny because, like, for Anderson, he's, like, not stoked that the fetters have been, like, gotten out of the way. You yeah. know what I mean? That they've just been gotten out of the way, and great, now we're left with this really shitty thing called capitalism. So then she goes on to talk about Robert Brenner. Um, the hero of the piece. Kind of, yeah, <laughs> yeah honestly, yeah, yeah. kind of the hero I mean, of I don't, the piece. I don't quite know what the, ac- the academic relationship was between... Uh, Meeksins, Woods, and Brenner, but mutual I, respect. I think, one yeah, think. collaborators and yeah. contemporaries, mm. uh, and they, yeah, of a similar ilk, of, yeah. from of a similar school. Yeah, not as a literal school, but like a yeah. school of thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so Brenner then really expands on what we were just talking about about how um, the train towards capitalism was in it unintentionally set right it wasn't really technologically determined it wasn't determined by people actively trying to make capitalism a thing it was um uh, as she says an attempt to uh reproduce themselves socially reproduce themselves um as they were and so like i was saying yeah brenner talks about how it wasn't just the nobility trying to keep their hold on peasants that um it was also the peasants trying to uh, just kind of keep their head above water and stay how stay with the status quo instead of things getting worse. And so this is kind of when um, England gets bought up, right? So she, so I'm just going to quote her here again. She says, In England, an exceptionally large proportion of land was owned by landlords and worked by tenants whose conditions of tenure increasingly took the form of economic leases, with rents not fixed by law or custom, but responsive to market conditions. The conditions of tenure were such that growing numbers of tenants were subjected to market imperatives, not to the opportunity to produce for the market and grow from petty producers into capitalists, but the need to specialize for the market and to produce competitively, simply in order to guarantee access to the means of subsistence subsistence into the land itself. This was in contrast to peasants who, because they remained in direct possession of their means of subsistence, were shielded from competition and the compulsions of the market, even if they engaged in market exchange. So again, yeah, that's an attack on like markets might exist, but they aren't necessarily capitalists. In England, these markets were increasingly becoming capitalist Mm -hmm. because peasants, in order to pay their rents, which weren't fixed to just like your local lord, as is my understanding, coming around and being like, "Yeah, give me half of that." You know, give me yeah, a couple yeah. of these. And then, like feudalism was incredibly stable because, like, feudal peasants as well as the lords had quite a lot of rights. Mm. There was quite a lot of historic custom that governed a lot of these relationships, kind of thing. Um, whereas what seems to happen in England, which isn't given a full explanation in this portion of the books that we've read, so we can't sort of like yeah. elucidate it fully. Um, but as she says, the 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 price of the rent paid by uh, this the, the effective peasant in in uh, air quotes um, to the landlord was not fixed by tradition or custom, um, but by the profitability of that land. Yeah. And when the landlords realised that they could basically force their um, tenant farmers to operate along to trade on the market um, to endeavour to uh, make their work and their investment um, increasingly productive. Uh, you set in train this po- this motion toward capitalism because you make it an, an imperative uh, for both of those contending classes that pr- um, work and labour be productive um, in a capitalist fashion rather than... Um, functioning 
in terms of the way it had under feudalism. Exactly, yeah. So, I mean, if you just imagine that you're just, like, some schmuck living in, like, say, some tiny Kentish village, perhaps, um, and all of a sudden, may, well, maybe not all of a sudden, but uh, let's just say your, your, your forefathers were able to just kind of have an agreement with the local lord. Right. And, you know, like I said, the local lord comes by and he's like, give me a couple of apples or whatever it is you make. And he takes that. You're kind of bummed, but whatever. So now all of a sudden, if your local lord is asking you for money every, I don't know, like say it's every month or something, right? A fixed, a fixed term. Um, now you're going to have to do a couple things, right? Because you're going to have to make sure that you have money as opposed to just maybe even just trading in kind. And so you're going to have to either sell your labor for a wage, which is again, what kind of like leads into capitalism, or you're going to have to go and take what you produce and sell it on a market. And when you sell it on a market, you become, again, like not only do you become dependent on making money from the market, but you depend on the markets being good and all this different stuff. So you become something it's, it would maybe seem like a subtle change. Maybe it wouldn't, I'm not sure, but it was, it was a very large change, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you then get yourself in the position whereby the tenant farmers can be so unproductive that their business isn't sustainable anymore. And this is where you then begin to see the production of a class of person who um, has no direct uh, means of production of their own, and therefore they become um, uh, waged workers for the more successful tenant farmers. Um, but what's interesting about this is what, what we were saying before about um, it being a change, but a change which um, wasn't initially... Um, didn't initially upset the class relationships of feudalism. Like the the change happened, but you still have feudal, effectively feudal peasants and effectively uh, feudal landlords. Um, it wasn't that there was some other class of capitalists that came in and disrupted the whole model. Mm. Like the change happened, and then that change began to produce two new contending classes exactly the successful tenant farmers and the unsuccessful uh, peasants who then had to tra transition to become waged workers of some form or other either working on farms or working in some kind of like uh, household production yeah. um mm. and that, that and the like exactly yeah and this is all it's important to note too that you know this you notice that this is all happening prior to the industrial revolution so it isn't like we created the steam engine and now everybody's specialized it's like no it was kind of like this uh process of specialization before that mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. uh yeah that uh, that preceded the industrial revolution yeah which is which is a really yeah. interesting like kind of like paradigm shift if you begin to think of history like that right yeah, yeah. i mean it isn't that where uh, 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 history is kind of driven by these things that we make and by like these, because I mean, technological determinism to a certain extent relies on the great man theory of history, right? It's like, thanks Eli Whitney for creating the cotton gin. Now we, now we have a lot of slavery, you know, because of his invention. It's like, well, no, I mean, it, yeah, it's just a different way of looking at uh, history. Right? Sure, yeah, I mean, and it, it, this is coming back to where we, our starting point, which was, um, we need an explanation for the transition which doesn't presume the prior existence of the things which we're trying to explain. You cannot explain the technological developments that were the Industrial Revolution if you can't first explain how capitalist social relations came into being. Mm. Um, something has to happen in feudalism which changes social relations and the way people behave toward each other, um, which necessitates a development of behaviors which culminate in um what we consider to be contemporary capitalism mm, exactly exactly and it does again i mean that totally turns on its head the perceived marxist view of uh the bourgeois revolution as precipitating capitalism right because um she makes the point that in France, the French Revolution wasn't necessarily a capitalist one because mm -hmm. the socialist uh, relations weren't there. This was, this was just bourgeois guys. You know, there's a difference there. This is just guys being like, we want to engage in markets. Yeah, you know the bo I mean? bourgeois just means like city dweller. Exactly. Is it not? In French, at least. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, it's just a class of person that's not noble, but it's also not. It's just some, just some kind of intellectual labor mm. and potentially lives in the city kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah, it comes from um, Burger. And it, it, in the case. Yeah, quite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, in the case of the French Revolution, it didn't even mean 
like merchants basically it meant lawyers exactly and, like government functionaries of some sort or other mm-hmm. um yeah 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 it's, it's really interesting it really does it really does turn on its head to say that um the french revolution was bourgeois but not really capitalist mm. um and if the 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 capitalist revolution what what well, no the english revolution <laughs> the english civil war and the changes that came as a consequence of that um were capitalist but not really uh, perpetuated by the traditional bourgeoisie um, absolutely yeah. yeah yeah and it's okay so should we should we take this to the next level? <laughs> should we use this information? Play like the Twilight Zone music. <laughs> dun, dun. This is not the Twilight Zone. Um, yeah, I have really no idea. That's right. Yeah. Um, fix it in post. <laughs> fix it in post. Um, so, if we kind of lose this idea of the revolution as precipitating mass change, right? If we kind of get rid of that idea of like kind of like old school Marxist idea of like, well, you need the bourgeois revolution first and then you can have the socialist revolution. And then from there, it's, you know, easy sailing. Mm -hmm. If the thing that created, I guess, these revolutions, but more importantly, created these changes in society, or at least precipitated them, was a change in social relations and not just like this abrupt, like either technologically determinist stuff, somebody invented something, or like the kind of like left-wing idea of just um, a revolution and boom, you're there, right? Um, because again, like you brought up the French, or not the French, the English, like none of us say this correctly, the English Civil War, the English Revolution, as um, it didn't really bring about anything abruptly, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it did, because it kind of got people thinking about like, well, maybe we don't need a king, maybe we need a king, (laughs) right? But it it brought about new ideas and it brought about all this stuff, but it didn't really change society in the way that we kind of like to think that it did. And same with the French Revolution, right? I mean, it takes longer and there's a lot more that happened before that. So if we then kind of try and apply these ideas to what could potentially happen with a socialist revolution, if social relations have to change in order for the mode to change, um, where does that leave us? Like, because because how could you? Is it even possible to change social relations in capitalism without a massive upheaval that changes society instantly? Without kind of like a, without an abrupt class war? You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. again, like to that question, would a class war? Would a revolution do anything in the mm-hmm. long run, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, it do, it do, it does decenter the significance of revolutions to um, the historic process of the transition from one economic model to the other. Um, I think a um, a theory of the sort that you're after, which was if it were to be informed by what we've read today, Merckx's Woods, Brenner. And also, also E. P. Thompson's uh, theories of class, which you haven't really talked about, but uh, featured a little briefly in this portion, um, you would have to look to class struggle, because that's as we were saying before, like um, it was the struggle between classes, the relationship between feudal classes that created the circumstances for the emergence of capitalism, and similarly, the conflict between classes in France, perhaps that um, precipitated that development. But um, beyond looking to the relationship between exploited and exploiting classes, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what you get. Yeah, yeah, because I don't, I don't even, I don't even know what those changes would be. Like if we're just spitballing, you know, the change the thought about the capitalist uh, uh, mode, you know, was this idea of like them just trying to keep the status quo going and that you know everybody just trying to keep what they had Mm -hmm. and that just suddenly or not suddenly but again like precipitated this change um through kind of like involve uh, involvement in markets and it wound up being that the state really you know had to protect against uh, against what that did to society but at the same time the state had to completely change um so it's it's strange i don't because i just i just really don't see how capitalists would ever give an inch towards anything that even like smacked of socialism Mm -hmm. and i guess you would probably say that if you were just like again some schmuck peasant down at the pub you're like oh i don't see how my lord would ever change right um but yeah i don't know i maybe i I don't even have a point here it's just like what would that even possibly look like as in precipitating a socialist revolution like okay we've, we've read this we like understand it and now it's you know we have an understanding of what capitalism is um uh how it was bought about but, uh, you know, how do you apply that? Like, what was the point? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, it's, yeah, I don't mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, it's wor- know. I mean, it's worth considering that um, 
by virtue of not being a technological determinist, historians like Ellen Mixon's Wood and Robert Brenner, um, and to some extent um, E.P. Thompson, are quite often accused of being voluntarists. Yeah. Um, Woods and Brenner are pejoratively referred to as uh, political Marxists. Um, the 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 implications of that being that they they don't they center sort of like um, behave the behavior between political agents as being the thing which sort of like precipitates social change. Um, so it, if the point that we've got to is making us feel sort of debilitated or like <laughs> unable to act. Um, we we are at least in the position where um, it is conflict between uh, rational. Not I don't want to go like rational agents, yeah. it's all yeah. kind of like, but like conflict between <laughs> self interested agents um, who are engaged in the social world in which they live and act on that social world and have can have consequence on that social world, um, as opposed to. People, as opposed to being um, agents who are fully at the whim of technological change mm. or some other sort of like non-human development, like the yeah. remove, like like the removal of any fetter on the emergence of capitalism um, in the sort of traditional explanations of the transition, mm. um, quite like uh, non-agentive processes, kind of thing, like. Whereas at least in this case, we have a process where there are historical agents and they are acting. Um, I don't know whether that can give us some solace in some respect. Uh, some, yeah. something, to, something to move toward, perhaps, as we think, as we do our sort of thinking. Kind of thing. Yeah, it would be interesting to kind of know what she thought about like the whole folk school of things. You know, about like, well, if, if we're kind of supposed to think that like a change in social relations precipitates any kind of change in mode or anything like that, um, what would the technology changing? Well, I mean, I, I I don't know. I guess I just answered my own question because it's like we've had the capacity to give everyone a good life for a long time now. You know what I mean? And that hasn't precipitated any kind of yeah, real yeah, yeah. like yeah, yeah. real change. I mean, uh, uh, you know, you I can like that's all Kapok can talked about was just like guys, come on, we can do it. Why aren't we giving yeah, everybody yeah, yeah, a good yeah, life? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I guess that. It, that is just the answer to technological yeah, make, yeah, determinists, yeah, 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 right? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. you can't believe that as soon as this technology shows up, it's going to change yeah. everything because, my God, we've had yeah. this since Kropotkin was yeah, talking yeah, yeah, in the 19th yeah. century. You know and it's, I mean? the, it's the same as the sort of opportunity slash compulsion. Like, sure, yeah. Like, people have had vast sums of wealth throughout history. Presumably, there have been markets. Presumably, they have, would have had some opportunity to b- behave as capitalists had they wanted to. But it took to the point where actually people had to be compelled to behave in a certain way. Yeah. Um, like we live under a system where there is opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't know how we um, how we compel ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's interesting too. Whenever anybody talks about an ancient mode of production as basically just being a timeless view of the Roman Empire, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's interesting to kind of think about like well what Romans thought about a guy like Crassus like everybody thought Crassus was just like a loser you know what I mean because Crassus was like the richest guy on the planet potentially the, one of the richest dudes ever right uh-huh. he just made a ton of money he was Julius Caesar's friend he was Pompey's friend for a while um, but everybody kind of didn't think of him as being as cool as Caesar or as Pompey because these were guys who had like honor right these yeah, were yeah guys yeah. who were like yeah you thought as someone had succeeded when they were honorable. And that's why Crassus tried to go conquer, you know, the East, you've tried to go conquer Parthia and like died immediately. Right? <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe we'll just get stuck talking about Roman history, but I think it's interesting that the different driving factors. Oh, it's, yeah. In, it's really interesting. Like, yeah. In, in modes of, sort of cultural motivation or yeah. like social or tradition or that kind of thing mm. have had much more sway over people's behavior at different times in history kind of thing yeah which i mean i guess that's just the general idea or the general hope right of a socialist revolution whether you're an anarchist or whether you're a left communist or a marxist or something right you have this hope that eventually people will be able to create the um necessities of survival with a motivation other than a wage right the motivation of i mean yeah it's very much like in the vein of Le Guin's dispossessed right it's like they're like, why would I want to get paid 
for creating what everybody needs. I mean, I want to help out my society because my society rules, baby. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And I think going back to the whole, the why I bought up Crassus, it's like, I think that uh, it points out just how incorrect the whole, like, you know, we wanted markets from the beginning, baby, and we got them. It's like, Romans oh, yeah, at yeah, least yeah. in like 50 BC <laughs> did not really think that was cool. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? That was not the coolest thing. And it also wasn't the real reason that they were conquering. They weren't conquering to, yeah, yeah, at least, yeah. you know, a lot of places they weren't conquering because they just wanted more money. I guess Caesar kind of conquered because he wanted more slaves. They kind of conquered Hispania because they wanted gold and stuff. But a lot of it was just like, I'm going to make my name, baby. Mm. Yeah. The Virgin Crassus and the Chad Caesar. <laughs> <laughs> The Virgin Crassus. Wouldn't be surprised, honestly. Yeah. Um, well, it wouldn't be an episode if we weren't uh, depressed at the end of it. Um, but I don't know. I'm not depressed. No, I'm. I'm excited. I'm infused oh. with the desire to go and engage with this material more. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll finish this reading. Reading this book. We will finish. And come back the book. to you. Yeah, that's we'll a find promise. some other things. Mm. Mm. And come back. Yeah, shame, shame too that uh, we we kind of uh, semi bought Corbin's suspension into being. Yeah, shame. But looking back, was there and was there any other way? <laughs> shame. It's all our fault. It is all our fault. Sorry, Corbin. Um, he'll be all right. Presumably, he will not struggle for money. <laughs> presumably, he'll be able yeah, to just fine. like eat. Yeah, don't you know he lives in like a million pound mansion in London? <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> socialism never works. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, I really don't know what's going to happen there. I mean, there might be a successful um, appeal, and he gets reinstated. Yeah, um, it's it's funny though. It's like, why couldn't they just have let him just be like the backbench MP? It's like you already relegated him to nothing. Like, I don't think he's going to be the leader. Yeah, there. yeah, it really does. It I I cannot work out what the motivations of Star Starmer's motivations are. I think it really um, must be someone over his shoulder being like fully stamp out this idea of socialism in the Labour Party. Get rid of Rebecca Long Bailey. Get rid of Corbyn. Um, mm. You just can't have it. It's It has to be more along the lines of the American model where we just get enough votes from like suburbanites on social issues. And that's yeah. It. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although, yeah, although maybe it's maybe really what his game is that he's trying to attract, attract back um, uh, rich investors or rich donors rather, not investors. Um, <laughs> well... <laughs> Um, but yeah, it does really seem to want to. It's almost it's almost performative. It seems like it's entirely performative, like right? The the degree to which he wants to go after these things, it, and I, I I don't really I don't what I've never what what struck me about um the um the Re Rebecca Long Bailey sacking, mm -hmm. and to, I suppose to some extent this as well. Um, well, with Rebecca Long Bailey, it just sort of felt like you by sacking somebody for. Anti-Semitism in that way, um, you you're really not helping make the story go away in any way. You're really just putting you're basically just you're putting a whole series of headlines out there that are anti-Semitism Labour Party. Yeah, yeah. And may, really. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe it gets associated with the left, but I don't really know what's happening in the in the heads of uh, the public kind of thing. And again, the same yesterday, like, um, does it serve, um, I don't, I, basically the question is, is it, is it Starmer's desire to actually um, disassociate the Labour Party from anti-Semitism? Or, um, I think no. Like, yeah, or, or is it, or, or is it still, I mean, it's, I, 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 I want to be careful with what I say now. <laughs> Nobody uh -oh. knows who I am, it's fine. Uh, Dan has been <laughs> suspended from the podcast. <laughs> But it's but it see it still feels like Keir Starmer and his cohort um, have some kind of functional relationship to uh, Labour anti-Semitism, and that it still it still serves some purpose to them. Yeah, you're right, because it was just supposed to be a tool of the Tories, right? Well, I mean, I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to get drawn into having a discussion about. Um, the extent to which anti-Semitism was a problem in the Labour Party, mm. because it was, mm. um, and it, it tremendously frustrating one to me all the way through. So yeah, I'm basically just trying not to litigate that. But the question to me is, does Keir Starmer want this to go away? And if not, what? Yeah, what game is he? Well, yeah, what game is he playing? Like, how does how does this how does this work on a PR level, which yeah. is meant to be his his 
sort of His role. realm of expertise kind yeah. of thing. Um, he looks like a PR guy. I, yeah, I, I don't know. He looks like he's trying to look tough. Yeah, he kind of does. He kind of and it doesn't. Like, it doesn't. It doesn't fly. It doesn't watch for me. I don't get it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> does not work for me. Here's a here's a um, question though. I mean, it, uh, yeah. I mean, if um, if there's something to be said about that report, it's been said by other people. But I'll repeat it now: is that like quite a sober report that we could have it. It could have actually set in train a process of reconciliation that could have um, could have allowed the Labour Party to at some on. point in the middling future to have actually put this thing behind them. Mm. Um, and in, in, I mean, in that respect, the behaviour of both Keir Starmer and Jeremy Corbyn have like got in the way of that. Um, so yeah, to some extent, I'm irritated with both of them. Yeah, well, I mean, I was going to say too. I mean, like, if you're Jeremy Corbyn, it would be nice for him not to go quietly. You know what I mean? It would be nice for him. It's like, okay, dude, like we were saying last week, like say what's on your mind. Like yeah. you can say it now. You're back to just being a backbench MP, uh-huh. and now it's like, okay, dude, like you're a backbench MP last week, and now you're just gone. You know what I mean? Presumably. So it's like, I don't know at what point, if ever, he's ever just going to be like, this is all made up. This is all mm. fake news. You're all wrong. Socialism, baby. I sort of get the impression that he's like, he spent the last five years holding his tongue and now he really wants to relitigate things that have happened previously. I mean, I mean, who wouldn't want to um, defend themselves against the charge of having been an anti <laughs> That's true, yeah. Or to have... Um... So yeah, I mean, I, I understand his desire to put the record straight, but he seems to have gone from being incredibly cautious and careful to somebody who's doing the equivalent of like tweeting at people at three o'clock in the morning <laughs> ranting and raving and no, maybe that's too harsh mm. but yeah i don't know i think we've just know. all kind of, as great of a job as he's done as he did we've always just kind of wanted a bit more you know mm. what i mean mm-hmm. obviously in our position and he's obviously caught in the impossible position of trying to give as much as he can to like guys like us but then also trying to grow the labor party which he did a very good job of, I must say. Mm-hmm. Which is all, which is again why this is also frustrating because it's like, you know, if the Labour Party ever wants to bounce back from Corbyn, it's like how many members did the Labour Party have under Corbyn? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like it was not insubstantial. Was it like six hundred thousand mm-hmm. or something, something like, like that? that? Yeah. yeah. Um, shame, real shame. Well, so we precipitated Corbyn being sacked last week. Uh, this week we're precipitating uh, this new thing <laughs> called capitalism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you look out, kids. Or our continued failure to overthrow communism, overthrow <laughs> capitalism, <laughs> overthrow communism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One day, one day we'll get Cuba. Yeah. One day. Um, so if we don't usher in communism in the next week, <laughs> you'll probably hear from us. Yeah, yeah. If, if, if not, I'm, I'm not coming. I'm not bothering. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, if you don't, as I said, you'll be suspended from the podcast. Uh-huh. You're on your own. <laughs> oh, God. It's a monocast. Um, I'll just go into, like, true crime around camp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just be like, uh, oh, the, oh, people are doing a bunch of whippets around here. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, yeah. Eventually, we'll get to part two. We might even—I don't know. Might do it next week. Might do it the week after that. Might yeah. do it never. Hopefully, uh-huh. we'll do it. Uh-huh. Um, we'll finish the book eventually. Um, I'm keen. Keen. Very keen. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's been a fun week. Fun week for the left. Um, and that was part one of Ellen Meeks Woods: The Origin of Capitalism. Um, we'll be back with part two. And uh, yeah, I'm Jack. I'm Dan. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Uh, these are your statements. We'll see you next time. Here we go. Music you heard this episode is Music to Kill Bad People 2 by King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. You can check out this song and more on their bandcamp at kinggizzard.bandcamp.com. If you like this episode, be sure and follow us up at Ox Statements on Twitter. That's A-U-X Statements on Twitter.com. And be sure and tune in next episode for more comedy discussion. Till next time. <laughs>